Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In episode 57, I talked to Walter Zapatagny about the Ardennes Offensive. Chatting with him, he told me about his new book coming out in 2018, looking at German penal battalions. That sounded like a great topic and right up my street. So I've got him back to talk with us today. But first, just a quick thank you to all the patrons who have joined our merry band in the last month. Welcome aboard. If you have a spare dollar and enjoy the show, why not sign up? Patreon.com slash WW2 podcast. Now, something for Patreon patrons I thought I would make you aware of. In the top right hand corner of the patron page of the World War II podcast page is an audio RSS link. Now, if you paste that into your podcast software of choice, all the extras I produce will automatically be downloaded for you if you want them to be. You can, of course, just listen to them in your browser. So if you'd like more World War II, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash WW2 podcast. So let's talk Straff Battalions. Welcome back, Walter. Your, your book was a bit of an eye-opener. It wasn't quite what I expected. Um, oh, is that right? Well, I, 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 I came at it from a, a, a completely white, pl- white page. I knew nothing about penal battalions. I was quite surprised at how divert They just weren't what I expected. You know, I sort of had this f- idea of, um, uh, is it Kelly's Heroes or someone like that? One of those strange war films, you know, where they're all sort of... Uh, is it Kelly's Heroes where they're all... Merrill's Marauder? No, it's not Merrill's Marauder. There are well, several films like that. But, yeah, uh, well, where they're all kind of, um, yeah, and it, 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 it was much more diverse. So, I mean, let's let's start with you know with defining penal battalions. You know, how how did the Germans? Well, how did anybody? How did how did they define penal battalions? I mean, well, are I they, guess, is that the official term, penal battalion, the official ing- anglicised name for them? There, there's a yeah, it's an anglicised name for a Straff battalion, but you know, they uh, they came to have many different names, and uh, you know, in the book, we, I talk about the, the various types of structures and so on that they had, but Straff battalion is a collect-all name that uh, really is uh, are military organisations that consist of convicted individuals that are mobilized for military service, I guess if you wanted to look at the Webster definition. But again, they took on a lot of forms. It wasn't just the, the German army of Wehrmacht that had them, of course, either. It was uh, Luftwaffe, Kriegsmarine had them. You know, it took on a lot of different forms. They they must have had a long history. I mean, I'm guessing the rest of the European uh, powers, with the exception of Russia, which had their own various variations in the Second World War. It must have been scrapped. What I found was that they go back to around the Napoleonic era in terms of dedicated penal units. Uh, and I think they envisioned them more so as large armies of recruits who suffered from some minor disciplinary problems or trouble. But even in the American Civil War, both sides had mobilized prisoners to do certain types of tasks and so on. I think the Germans, though, under Hitler, refined the process a little bit better, or a little bit more, if you will. A lot of it was based in the idea of what are we going to do with soldiers, people in the military, who claim to be conscientious objectors or who don't necessarily uh, subscribe to the Nazi ideals. And, of course, ones who commit what they considered to be minor offenses. I mean, you know, somebody who committed murder wasn't going to be put into necessarily Uh, until actually later in the war, wasn't going to be put into one of these units. So, you know, what do we do with them? Well, we can send them to a concentration camp like Dachau for re-education, and they did that. Or or we can give these people an opportunity to redeem themselves somehow by serving in a unit. And I think that's how it came to be. That was their reasoning, at least, anyway. And that started uh, really back to as early as 1938, when they start talking about this. In some serious manner, you know. You make reference in the book to actually the whole stab in the back idea from the, from the First World War and how you know that the, obviously the rise of Nazism sort of on that sort of stabbing the stabbing the back from the Germans losing the First World War. And I thought that was an interesting uh, point you make about taking those people out of the army. Well, they were very concerned, especially as the war went on. The Wehrmacht and, and the and the Nazi leadership were they were deathly afraid of the 
events that occurred in 1918, you know, the German Revolution, when, when they had the uprising of workers and sailors and soldiers all throughout Germany demanding wages and rights and were concerned about what the government, what they perceived the government to be doing. So they didn't want any of that. They didn't want anything to interrupt the war effort and interrupt their idea of how things should go. And uh, that was part of it as well. I mean, so many of these soldiers initially ended up in Dachau, ty- early Dachau type of camps, w- which were education, re-education camps. So, all right, well, you don't like the Nazi regime. Well, let's bring you into our re-education class and we'll show you why you should like the Nazi regime. If that didn't work, you know, there were other methods to, to deal with them, uh, the Gestapo being another one, of course. One, one of the things that was interesting that I found in the research, too, was that they used the uh, families to uh, motivate soldiers. The idea uh, then of guilt was considered to be a collective guilt. It was a family guilt. So if a family member committed some type of crime, then it shamed and somehow involved the entire family in that person's crime. So there are many instances of uh, someone committing a crime and the family, the entire family being punished. There was a bit of an incentive for some of these soldiers to want to redeem themselves so as to uh, bring less shame or to um, or to make sure that their families weren't uh, punished or suffered either. There's no history of it within the German army pre the rise of the Nazis and the rise of Hitler, was there? Not that I found, no. no I mean, there could have been some limited amount of it. I'm sure people experimented with different things. But as a collective effort, a national effort, no, I, I didn't see anything prior to the Nazis coming to power. And really, it was around 1938 when they started getting serious about this. And, and was was the system just based on military criminals, or did it include civil civil uh, criminals as well? For the most part, it was military. The, the, the court system, the civilian court system, of course, uh, once Hitler came into power in 1933, one of his fr- the first things he did was to break down the independence of the judiciary. You know, he removed all the anti-Nazi judges, he abolished all the guarantees for tenure, and so on. And um, the Reich Courts Martial was established as the high court for the Wehrmacht forces. And then um, they basically took the people who were in the military and presided over them. But it was primarily military, people who were already are soldiers. You know, did you know back then commanders, back in, uh, in around October or so, 36, they gave military commanders to the right to function as a court. So at, at about the battalion, what we'd consider to be about the battalion level, those, those, those officers acted as a judge. Many of these cases would go to them, and that's it. And they would decide the fate of the soldier. And so they acted on their own as judge and jury themselves, just the one man. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it didn't function as what one might have known as a courts martial where there's a group of them. That's correct. And it was after, after around October of 36 that they began to do that surprised that so early i could see that happening later in the war through just necessity but you know they're so they, in some respects they were such sticklers for administration i'm quite surprised that so early that uh, they brought that in well it was primarily military people that we're talking about here the civil court system still functioned as it did it just didn't have it, it only had nazi judges yeah. <laughs> you know, there, were, there weren't any there weren't any uh, judges that were that were not nazi because they were ferreted out you know, a long time ago <laughs> So there's no bias there if you're in front of the civil court. There's no bias. You know. <laughs> the other thing they did was uh, after around 39, they permitted court marshals to be held in the field, and they used to call them drumhead trials uh, or flying court marshals. And the, the drumhead trial comes from the they would set a drumhead there, and it would actually act as the table, you know, as the desk. And that's how that that term came to be. But the, they would be uh, there were roving groups that would, would provide preside over cases that had come up to the to the commander who who may have deferred it to these folks who, who roved around uh, they acted as the court as well presumably that's to keep uh the decision making as fast as possible to keep men either in the field or not in the field as fast as possible uh, absolutely that's part of it yes yes they didn't want to fool around with appeals or anything that what, what's the decision either you're going to prison you're going to talk to the gestapo you're going to a re-education camp. We're going to a unit that's going to go to the front. So, are they classed as? I mean, are they classed as prisoners if you're in the penal battalions? No, they were for the most part when they were uh, assigned to these units. They were integrated as soldiers. 
Now, there were people above them that would keep kind of keep an eye on them. They were charged to keep an eye on them because they knew they were prisoners or, or they had come from the penal system. But for the most part, they were considered soldiers like any other soldier. Uh, they had uh, uh, various uh, tasks to do. Some cases, it was the menial tasks that were that they were given, and in many cases in combat, it was the dangerous tasks. Almost the uh, you know you know your your chances of coming back are very high tasks. So if we if we look at you know getting into the unit, what what made these men and I, and I assume they were mainly male prisoners. Uh, you know what what made men eligible for a for a penal unit? Well, initially it was men who committed minor crimes and who showed a desire and ability to to redeem their for themselves, you know. A couple of rules that they had was the convicted had to conduct himself flawlessly until the time of the crime for which he had been condemned. In other words, he had his record had to be stellar before he committed a particular crime. The crime must had a, had to represent a, what they called a one-time blunder and could not be cause of a deficiency in character. For instance, they wouldn't accept homosexuals because they considered them to have a deficiency in character. The, the convicted uh, had to be had to show a sincere intention to improve himself. He had to be a member of the armed forces or liable for military service or fit for employment as a soldier. So this would, when you asked about were most of them military or civil, it, it would encompass f- those who were recruits or who were just in the process of joining because they threw them into the same barrel. You know, they had to be fit for employment in, in an infantry battalion or. In the case of the Craig's Marine or the Luftwaffe Grand Battalions, they had to be physically able to do that. The remainder of the punishment couldn't exceed, uh, had to be less than six months, which they were serving. And these are initial rules. Now, they changed a lot of this at the end of the war. You know? uh, and, and prisoners suffering punishments in a civil institution uh, had to uh, pass a one-month physical examination at a Wehrmacht prison to make sure that they are physically fit capable of conducting, of performing in these units. So those were some of the initial rules. At the end of the war, the demands for the manpower were so great that most criminals, except those who had committed really violent acts, were able to be transferred to penal units because they just needed the manpower. So they start relaxing these initial rules. I was quite surprised there were such sticklers for the uh, physical fitness uh, for, for such units. Yes. Well, they were they, they were assigning them dangerous missions and they knew that one had to be fairly physically fit to accomplish some of those missions, so it made sense, I guess. Well, it struck me as a strange, almost a duty of care that you know they're they're at least a, they're not overly worried about them coming back, but they at least want to make sure they're fit enough to have an, to attempt it. So there's kind of they're, 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 there's a hope that they can do it rather than just throwing men away. Yes, they're not cannon fodder per se. They're actually filling in units, or in some case, a couple of cases standalone units to serve a particular function and purpose. It wasn't just thrown like the Russians did, you know, when they started attacking the Germans where they would issue, they would uh, send troops to the field without any weapons, thinking that you'll pick up the weapons as you go. Well, they truly were cannon fodder, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, the, but the Germans didn't function that way. I mean, they actually uh, saw a purpose for them, whether it be, with a particular unit, or in the case of the 500th or and 600th Parachute Battalion and the Dauwanger Brigade, or 36th Waffen SS Grenadier Division, they, they had specific purposes, missions that they had to accomplish. I mean, what did men get for serving in such a unit? Is there, is there a benefit for, uh, I said volunteering? I could, could they volunteer or they'll put their name forward or? Sure, sure. Based on that criteria that I that, that I went over uh, initially, uh, well, they, you know, they could redeem themselves. They could have their conviction remanded or lowered. And one of the main incentives, of course, was that their family would not be involved in it. Uh, partial or complete uh, suspension of the sentence for serving at the front was uh, something that uh, you know they looked at and said, "Hey, this 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 could work." You know, I think one of the big factors was how the Germans, how the Nazis involved the family in this collective guilt thing. I've forgotten the German word for it right now, but it's in the book. It's a, a theory or, or more than a theory. It's a concept that they applied through all of the service branches and even to into civilians, to the civilian side. If you did something, then your family's going to suffer too. And they thought that would be a deterrent for people doing these bad, what they considered to be bad things. Yeah, I, I made a sort of a, a strange note that you know, it, 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 the whole system sort of seems to 
designed to reinforce the na- Nazi sort of doctrine of don't, don't deviate or step out of turn, uh, yes. but you can socially redeem yourself. That's right. Um, exactly. Uh, which is, well, it's a harsh system, but I, you know, there, it, there's a strange, there is a strange logic to it. <laughs> yes, they had their <laughs> Nazi logic, I guess. So. Yeah. Um, but, but it's, the, it's sort of simplistic just to return, refer to sort of straff battalions because there's a number of layers to the system, isn't there? They're, they're not just, there's not just one sort of penal unit and in they go. No, straf, the, the, the term or word straff battalion is, you know, it, it's just a catch all, catch all phrase to, to account for patrol units, probation units, criminals that were in regular units, special pur- purpose units that were developed. So, you know, there's a number of them. And um, and even below those, there were subs of those as well. But, yeah, it, it's just a generic catch-all phrase. I mean, we had to put something. I mean, you can't spell it all out in the cover of a book, you know. So uh, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about penal battalions. Okay, there's a lot to penal battalions, and that's what we try to address in the book. There is, but I think there's sort of an expectation of them just being sort of low-grade infantry, sort of uh, rough and ready uh, that you throw in. And, and it is so, well, it's typically typically complicated system that they seem to have uh, to to have drawn up with the parole battalions and the uh, you know, light African division, and, and the whole designation of the numbers. And then you fill custody detachments, and yeah. You know, <laughs> that's right. so much to it. Well, that's typical German, typical German efficiency, you know, uh, at the time. I mean, you know, they were, <laughs> they had a, they had their method, you know. <laughs> how, how political was the system? Or was it purely based on the military commander's judgment? Well, a lot of it was on the military commander's judgment. But, you know, one has to, has to remember that it was as political in the sense it, it, that it was controlled by Nazis. And anyone who challenged the Nazi ideals or the government found themselves in trouble. You know, what, one of the biggest offenses that one could commit would be saying something bad about the about the government, or about even a soldier, a hero. I mean, that was terrible. I mean, that was a major offense. So, in the sense, you know, uh, many of these leaders, military leaders, were also members of the Nazi Party, and some of them didn't they, they didn't get promoted if they weren't. You know, in that sense, it was political. I mean, we mentioned the units before, uh, and whilst obviously, why it's sort of militaristic, it's it's a it's a graduated scheme. Men can go up and down through these layers, can't they? Yes, that's that's correct, based on their performance, and uh, in the units and the or the containment facility, they could go up and down the whole system. One of the stops was visiting the Gestapo. Which is not something that anybody wanted to aspire to, you know. I presume that's at the bottom of the. Uh, of yeah, that's the probably yeah. yeah. If everything else works, you're going to have an appointment with the Gestapo, and they're going to decide <laughs> if you're going to um, something greater than an, an, a re-education camp. So, what's at the top of that ladder? The, the p- p- parole battalions. The p- parole battalions, right? And that they're sort of second chance so- soldiers, and then everything else is sort of somewhere in the middle. Yeah, the patrol battalions were kind of like the first stop to see, you know, if there was a chance this person could have, could in fact redeem himself, and if so, they would send him out to the to the units or to one of the units that were established for that purpose. Um, many of them didn't cut the mustard, so to speak. I mean, they didn't meet the criteria, and so they either stayed in prison under hard labor uh, or you know, went to see the Gestapo, as I mentioned. It's funny because I think a lot of people would think to themselves, you know, see, you're sitting here you know, 70 plus years, you're 80 plus years later. Well, I prefer to stay in prison, but, uh, you know, they necessarily uh, go to war. But, you know, it must have been something to aspire to for the prisoners rather than prison. So, you know, prison life must be. <laughs> well, I think prison life under the Nazi regime, depending upon what prison you're talking about, was pretty, pretty bad. So uh, I, I would think most would want to get out and find some other way to uh, to serve their time if they had to do that. Even if they had to go to a parole battalion or a, or a, a probation unit, it's got to be better than sitting in a, in a prison. The prison conditions weren't very good. And did that, I mean, I know they get, got 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 uh, difficult almost suicidal jobs to do i mean were their co- other 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 than that were their were their conditions better i mean did they get better did they did they get paid did they get 
regular food, you know, calorific, enough calories and things like that? Sure. They were, uh, they, for the most part, they were integrated into the units they were assigned to, just like any other soldier. There were non-commissioned officers and officers who did not like the idea of them being there, and they treated them rather harshly. But, you know, I think in any unit, if a non-commissioned officer or an officer doesn't like someone, they're, they're probably going to treat them harshly. But for the most part, they were accepted as long as they did their job the way they're supposed to do it. Uh, they were in, they integrated into the uh, into the units and, and and they did what they had to do. Who officered the unit? The officers that who were assigned to the unit, they, they fell under their control. But they also had, uh, and sometimes they had other people that were assigned at the officer level just to watch over these individuals to make sure that they were adhering to the requirements of service in the unit. For the most part, though, they were officered by the officers of the unit. I, cause I was, yeah, I couldn't work out if you, if you're an officer prisoner, you could become an officer in the in the penal unit, uh, you know, or if it was a, a leveling system. And I wondered if, if if it was regular officers. Well, if I was a regular armor officer given in charge of a penal unit, knowing that that they they got the worst jobs, it wouldn't necessarily be a job that I'd be wanting to do would be the officer in charge of that unit. <laughs> well, I, I think it came down to, uh, you know, you're ordered to do it and, uh, you know, you, you, you do what you're ordered to do. You may not like it. You may not like it. And many didn't, I'm sure, but they did what they had to do. How much, if we if you, we talk about these these units without any number to them, presumably their numbers expanded and contracted as the war went on. What what kind of numbers are we are we talking about from, from the very start? Well, from the very start, it was very, very, it was small, and, and they were just trying to feel it out. When the first major uh, number of unit of soldiers that were sent to units began when the uh, began at the Polish Poland invasion, and then more were added as they went into France. The uh, higher command, the German higher command, was very pleased with what they saw of the performance of most of the soldiers. As the war went on, the numbers started to grow and then eventually grew exponentially. By the end of the war, around 82,000 or so had served in what was called the 500 battalions. And about another, numbers are hard to pin down here, but another 25 to say 40,000 served in the 999 units, which primarily were in Africa. So now we're, we're looking at somewhere between 100 and some to 120 some thousand soldiers who had gone through the system. Again, numbers are hard to pin down. I don't know that this accurately, if those numbers accurately account for the folks who never came back from these dangerous missions, you know, and there was no record of them, no account of them. What What were the 500 battalions? The 500 bat named battalions were a category that they used initially for service in the continent, you know, and there's a number of them that I identified in the book, and they had different tasks, different uh, missions. The, the 999 units were primarily the uh, Africa Brigade 999. It was deployed in Africa. It was a set up as a, as a separate unit. So what, what kind of soldiers did this system produce? In some cases, the soldiers could not redeem themselves, and they were malingerers. They didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they ended up not getting out of it what they thought they were going to get out of it, or worst case, being sent back to prison or a visit to the Gestapo. In some cases, it produced heroes. Of the uh, 500 battalions, uh, around 13 or so officers were awarded the Knight's Cross. So homosexuals, traitors, gypsies, and Jews, of course, were excluded from all this. I mean, they, you know, they, they were off to different camps, Auschwitz and others, you know. So in many cases... They fought heroically. Other cases, they were just so so. <laughs> well, it's such a hard, harsh system. The only way is up, if I guess, if you're fighting, if you've got you've got a chance to redeem yourself, you keep at it. Was was my assumption uh, for a lot of these guys? It it was that, or potentially um, work their way down and be handed over to the Gestapo, which is possibly a big stick to beat forward people. <laughs> Big, a big, big piece of encouragement to not do that. That that would be enough of a threat for me. I don't know about anybody else. But, you know, I'd want to keep going and keep out of their hands. Or any the other thing too. I mean, they don't want to go back to prison either. As 
and nobody wants to sit in prison if there's an opportunity or a chance that they might be able to redeem themselves somehow. Maybe not even redeem themselves in, in the philosophical sense, but so they don't have to go back to prison in that sense. How strict were they, uh, I would say officers, how strict were they, were they looked after? I mean, could they be sanctioned directly in the field by their commanding officer more so than, say, regular infantry, or, or, or did it all, uh, you know, some other procedure? No, they, they were, uh, once they were assigned to a unit, they were basically looked at just like any other soldier. The authority for disciplinary actions was given down, like I was, like I was saying earlier, to a battalion level command level about battalion level commanders and uh, they effectively ans- acted as courts disciplinarians i'd say sanctions range from you know minor discipline to transfer back to prison or the firing squad depends on what they did you know as the war went on there was more and more of uh, drumhead courts marshals and uh, someone was was um, accused of diver- desertion or or theft or something like that they would hold that trial right there in the field, pass judgment, and put him before the firing squad. Well, presumably, as the war went on, as we mentioned, these units expand. So presumably, the quality of the recruit gets further from those uh, those very professional infantrymen of 1940. So you've really got much more odds and sods. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I think those... Uh, Initial criteria, those seven or so that we were talking about earlier, I mean, that kind of, you know, I'm sure a lot of them didn't meet all those, that criteria by the time the war was near end. I mean, they just needed people. And they started throwing a lot of people at the Russian front and they were emptying the prisons out, you know. Yeah, I wonder if those early units actually had a stranger spree to call because that's a, a pretty professional army in 1940. So if you end up in a penal unit, you really do have, uh, you really want to get out of it. You work hard at it and these are you know, well-trained professional men but obviously by the end they've been thinned out quite a lot uh, i think i think initially uh some of the men who joined these units changed and it became different people as a result of that professionalism the disparate core that many of those early these units early on had you know like like anywhere in, in society though some didn't you know and some were just criminals and they never did change yeah. There's a couple of units that I thought we'd have a look at, which I was surprised at. The, the SS Parachute Battalion, they, they, they were half penal, half volunteer battalion? Yeah, that was an experiment that they uh, they were looking to do here. A lot of those uh, soldiers came out of the SS penal camp at Dachau and some other ones. They're probably best known for their unsuccessful parachute and glider assault on Tito's headquarters back in May 44. And they did some other did some other missions as well. But those were men who... Uh, they were either disgraced officers or enlisted men who had uh, performed minor disciplinary actions. Uh, they had minor disciplinary sentences. So th- they weren't the hardcore criminals, if you will. Now, uh, in October of that of 44, they were incorporated in what became the 600th Parachute uh, Battalion, and uh, they, they participated in the Ardennes Offensive. Actually, um, um, did a pretty good job in the Ardennes offensive. Well, it sort of it, it goes to show how uh, you, almost egalitarian they, they are with these pe- 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 penal units uh, to have them in such an elite an elite unit uh, 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 as, as the SS, no less, and the parachute uh, battalion. Well, uh, but keep in mind, the only they only had half of the unit was penal. The, yes. the other, the other half were dedicated SS soldiers. <laughs> Quite a, I mean, these people were committed. You were, I, I the presumably, cause. presumably, they were handpicked, handpicked criminals that they only took as well. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> well, again, it was minor, minor disciplinary offences. Yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't anything serious or, or murder, rape, none of those, you know, sentences. Yeah, so you, you you could probably cherry pick some quite good uh, good troops who've just uh, mm-hmm. you know dropped drop the ball only once. And, and as, thor- as thorough as the as the Germans were, though, in, in in those things that they did like that, I'm sure they did some screening, and some pretty extensive screening when they wanted to give a person an opportunity to redeem themselves. Uh, they probably did some psychological evaluations and made some judgments as to what their they thought your success would be. Well, I got that feeling because the whole system so unbelievably uh, administered, seemingly administrative heavy. Uh, so they must have large files on people saying where they might or might not fit uh, to slot them into the system. 
Sure. Uh, yeah. is what well, everybody had a file, you know, so <laughs> just a matter of looking at the file. They should have maybe freed up some more bureaucrats doing all this paperwork, and they might have had some more trips free for the front. They might have had some more trips. They might have won the right, they might have run the Russian campaign. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, the other, the other brigade to stand out with to me was the, is it the uh, Durlwanger Brigade? Yeah, the Durlwanger Brigade. Often, uh, that's a common name for the 36th Waffen SS Grenadier Division. That came together in February, I think, 20th of 45. And uh, with them now, here, here we have most of the members were from concentration camps. A few of the soldiers were, were communists, political prisoners. Most were common criminals. The thing that, that stands out with them is their commander, Oscar Detweiler. It's interesting that he had a Ph.D. in political science. He was a brutal drunkard, uh, would beat people. He got expelled from the SS on moral offenses. And he was the first, first member of the Nazi party who was evicted and imprisoned in 34. He allegedly raped a 14-year-old girl, stole a car, crashed it while he was drunk. You know, so he served a couple of years in, in jail for that. One of the police reports called him mentally unstable. So how does this guy become responsible for this, what became a division? That's absolutely amazing. Probably well known for their atrocities in Poland, uh, against Poles and Jews during the Warsaw Ghetto. They had a large part to play in the liquidation of the ghetto in the autumn of 44. Uh, they fought in Hungary, Hungarian sector of the Russian front, 44. And around October, they had about 4,000 men. They had Luftwaffe convicts as part of them as well. They had a reputation for being ruthless, bad in all their actions. And, of course, a lot of it has to do with the, the commander who probably set that tone. It's amazing to me how in the world he could come from serving a prison sentence for raping a 14-year-old girl to being the, a division commander with that amount of responsibility. It's absolutely amazing to me. So maybe when you ask about the politics of the system, you know, it seems to me he must have been politically connected somehow. Somebody liked him. It could have even been Himmler. You know? Well, him could have been him. Himmler. Himmler's the one that would have had to appoint him. Yeah. Well, uh, he's such... You see, he's well, you know, such a good World War One record, and he's been in the Nazi Party f from the start. You know, there, there's so many potential strings to his bow, other than the fact that he's clearly a hardened madman. I was going to say criminal. He's, he's clearly a bit of a madman. Well, I think the uh, the police report in '42 that called him mentally unstable was right on target. I mean, this guy was, you know, and plus, you know, he's an alcoholic on top of it, and. I mean, you wonder how much of his, his militarily, how good he was, or was he just uh, bloody-minded? I think more so bloody-minded. <laughs> that that was sort of my impression. You know, he'll get the job done at any costs. It's interesting, though, when you look at this division, uh, started as a brigade and became the division, compared to, say, the soldiers of the 500th, uh, even though they weren't successful in the Tito headquarters and, mission, you know, they, they perform pretty well in the Ardennes with the 600 and other units as well. I mean, they, there's there's certainly evidence that these many of these soldiers blended in well and, and did a pretty good job. In this respect, they sort of stand out because they they are exactly how you expect a penal b b unit to, to be. Sort of yet they were yet they were the exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, because they, you expect them to be sort of sort of a law unto themselves and sort of fulfil certain stereotypes, like the film that I can't remember about the American penal unit, which I really should have looked up before we got started. It's really annoying me now. Uh, uh, you know, unreliable. You know, a bit mad and ruthless. Uh, yet, as you say, they're they're, they're the exception to the um, to the to, to the whole thing. How, how, how effective do you think the whole system was? Well, I think due to the nature of the assignments that they typically had, most never really achieved a lessening of their sentences. I, I think, I, again, statistics are hard to find on this, you know, but probably not that many people really got their sentences lowered or were able to free themselves of whatever their conviction was. Many of them died at the front trying. Which I'm not sure if that's that makes it, effective or not if you can't ever get out it almost seems that if you or if you don't see your comrades getting out you know it makes you wonder what you meant to, you know how you feel about that if you just have to keep trying harder if you never see anyone leave well especially after tide turned in russia many of them didn't see their comrades doing anything because they died in stalingrad and other places you know? yeah 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 they, they died trying yeah, yeah. 
And was the system similar for the Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe? Uh, to a lesser extent, but the Kriegsmarine uh, did establish a special section at Hela on the Baltic, and they had battalion-sized units for disciplinary cases, not as many as the Army, of course. They had, uh, as an example, the 30th Ship Cadre Battalion, the 31st was formed. Uh, they worked in the North Sea. Many of them were ground units. They weren't really at sea. They weren't support units. The Luftwaffe had confinement platoons within their sections, supervised usually by a non-commissioned officer. Typically, it was for pe- people who were not aviators but were ground personnel who were convicted of less serious offenses. Redemption by combat was a substitute, though, again, with them, with both of those, uh, as it was with the, with the German army. That's what we were saying before about how you, uh, about your almost sedition, you don't necessarily want to put uh, penal units on ships in case they uh, do anything peculiar or, or on submarines, in fact, and rebel, and then you lose a, a valuable piece of wartime equipment to to. to <laughs> to the stab in the back from the First World War. Probably, uh, if if one was to categorize the the standard, if you will, Luftwaffe was number one, then the Kriegsmarine, then it went to the Army in terms of what they're willing to accept and put and who they're willing to put in what positions. Obviously, you can't have somebody that's <laughs> you, you don't want somebody that's a criminal flying your airplanes. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and you're right about the ships too. It's the same thing. So a little bit different, you know, uh, high value pieces of equipment. You have to be careful who's doing what with them, but but again, they they also bought into this process and and set up units um, to uh, give people a chance to redeem themselves. And again, I think as the war went on, you know, maybe they didn't really want to do this, but they saw that where else are they going to get the people? They were so uh, deprived of manpower, even in the Kriegsmarine and in the Luftwaffe, they had to do something. Where are these people going to come from? You know? It's very pragmatic. You know, it, 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 they're probably more useful than slave labor the way you could just get slave labor from uh, occupied countries if you could take your own people and arm them. Sure, absolutely. What, what's the incentive for a slave to uh, – somebody who's involved in the slave labor to, to do any better work? Where the incentive for these soldiers is, look, we're going to reduce your sentence and we're going to leave your family alone. Yeah. That's a pretty good incentive when you think about it. It is. It is. It is. Especially considering how when, when, some of those uh, pressed units uh, that they had didn't necessarily perform very well. Uh, the German, some of the foreign national units that they pressed into service didn't, didn't do very well. Although that said, some of the SS units fought uh, volunteers, that fought exceptionally well, but some of those other uh, turncoat units that they managed to get performed appallingly didn't they yeah yeah they did well i think i think that's all my questions i had uh, noted down for you uh thanks so if you want to pick up a copy of the book and look in detail at these units the book is straff battalion hitler's penal battalions by walter sapatagini as usual i have a link to the book on the website www2podcast.com I hit another milestone last month with over 4,000 Facebook likes. I'm not quite sure what that actually means, but thank you. Followers of the podcast on Facebook do get pictures and links that I do post up, which usually are in reference to the latest episodes. So if you uh, use Facebook and that sounds like it might be up your street, unsurprisingly, you can find me at WW2 Podcast. So that's all for now. Thanks for listening.